infinite complacency. People went to and fro of the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, binning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. So in this edition of Into the Fray, I welcome on a couple of local guys that do some paranormal research, so I'm really excited to have them on. And local, I mean like Las Vegas, not just Nevada. Most of us are down yonder here in the south part of the state. And these are the founder and co-founder and lead investigators of Black Seas of Infinity. Paranormal, cool name, by the way. We'll discuss that And the way that I found you guys, and we were just laughing before we started this, was I was on the Nextdoor app and I get on there mostly for entertainment purposes because the things that people post is it's interesting what they complain about or what they might be worried about. And I just find it a little entertaining, sometimes helpful though. And there was, and maybe Spence, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I I should have screenshotted it actually the second I... uh, had reached out to you, but there was a a young lady, I would say that was on there kind of mentioning some things going on in her house. And it did in fact sound a little paranormally, if you will. And you commented on there and you said, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm such and such and get in touch with me if you want. It sounds like there might be something going on. And I don't know if she got in touch with you, but I did. And I have never reached out to anybody through the next door app, really for any any reason, especially not for my show, which I told you, but I it was fortuitous because now here we are chatting, and as I said, an email to you both. Besides, like Steve Stockton, who used to live here, I haven't talked to a whole lot of people that locally they they were here, they were investigating, they had things happen to them. So this is uh, this is very nice for me, and let me. If if I didn't introduce properly, it's Spence, who is lead investigator in logistics of Black Seas of Infinity, and John Thrasher, who is the founder, lead investigator, and tech specialist, which all these things came handy today when we were trying to uh, connect. So welcome on, guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Yeah, it was, uh, it was extremely fortuitous the way that I came across you guys, because I... I, I haven't seen, if I have, it has slipped my mind. I don't know if I've seen you guys anywhere online, posts or anything like that, but it's it's really good to talk to a couple of local people. And you guys have been really all over Nevada for your investigations, it looks like. And I asked for an outline, and you sent me such a good one that I don't really need to do any work because it's set up exactly as I would have done an interview. So thank you, John. You made that very easy on me. And I will go down the list that you sent me. So I would, of course, like to start with the time old traditional first question. And how in the world did you guys get interested in the world of the paranormal? Well, you know, I'll start with that one. You know, like I think like most, it's it's a personal experience that you have and it fascinates you. And, you know, in my case, it happened to be, uh, you know, my wife and I were were in the house. I was in one room. She was in another. And, uh, you know, a shadow figure, you know, just kind of breezed right by me and uh, it, my hair st- stood up in a coldness. But she, you know, went right into the room she was in. I saw it and it went right into that direction. And before I got it. The chance she came out and said the exact same thing. She described the identical thing that I just saw. So, you know, there, there's not a doubt. In that case, what we both experienced was, in fact, something. So from that point, you know, we uh, looked around at some paranormal teams that were already formed in Las Vegas. And it, we had some great experiences with some other ones. And then, uh, you know, John and I decided to branch off and uh, you know, kind of start our own. Nice to have a confirmation experience with someone else there. Yeah, no question. I, that's it's funny because uh, when someone tells a story, you know, especially in the paranormal 
business. You know, when you tell the story without any proof, it becomes questionable. So mm-hmm. yeah, in, in, in my case, uh, having that come through like that, uh, it, it was great. Now, I, of course, the first thing we do is, you know, we go and we look up the history of the house that we were living in and, you know, to see if anybody passed in the house. And often the case, as they say, uh, the spirit kind of gets stuck in this dimension and can't move on for whatever reason. Maybe, maybe a loved one is having a problem letting them go. And, and that's, that's usually the case. So I uh, didn't find much history on it, but in that particular instance, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it got, it's, it got the ball rolling for sure with me. And I don't know if this got cut off, but is this a house that you're still in? No, no, actually I've been in, uh, it was the house right before the one I'm in now. Okay. Uh, but ironically, I mean, you know, and, and John will have a similar story, you know, the, the one that I am in now, there was in fact, a, a elderly person, you know, that had passed really not, not much activity in the house I'm in. But again, you know, I, like I was saying is often, I think it's, especially if it's an elderly person, often the, the loved ones are not holding on as tight. In other words, they want them to go. They want them to, to, to move on. Younger people that pass, it's a lot harder, of course. And so I think uh, that plays a, a big role, honestly, in, in spirits staying behind. And that shadow person that you and your wife saw, was that a one and done? Or did you guys see that shadow person or entity well, again? Well, that's interesting. Not not that, uh, not the shadow. I mean, and, it, and to be honest, it was more of a, a mist. It wasn't necessarily a full body apparition type of thing. It was It was more of a cloudy kind of thing that went through. But my wife, I believe, was pregnant at the time, you know, a year later or maybe a year and a half later. Our uh, son's bedroom was, you know, upstairs and we had some, some interesting things with that where he's mommy, mommy, you know, the man in the room was talking to me and things like that. Now, obviously, I don't want to say you take it with a grain of salt, but when a one and a half year old is saying that to you, you know, their imaginations kind of sometimes get the best of them. But I don't know. It was interesting. It was, he, he seemed very confident in what he was saying. So, uh, I mean, it didn't bother us. I mean, it didn't scare us at all. You know, it's not the reason we left the house, but yeah, you know, it just, like I said, it, it kind of got the ball rolling for me. Yeah, that'll do it. That's what did it for me, uh, sh- the shadow people. So there you go. Well, how about you, John? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, when uh, I was you know, very young, probably around eight years old, uh, we was living in Kentucky in an older house, uh, not too far from my grandparents uh, out in Calhoun, Kentucky. And um, out of just kind of just, I don't know, just having fun with my brothers and my brother and sister. We formed our own little paranormal team um, at that age, young, very young age. And we'd just go around the house and, you know, make up things with our imagination. And I'd be out front, there'd bricks out front. We'd turn over a brick and there's a number on it. And then there was like this portrait of this lady with an, I think it's called an ermine, like a skinless cat in the foyer. It was a creepy picture and it looked like she was looking at this rock. And I had a little notepad and I would write things down. And it was just a really fun thing to do when we were that young. And then, uh, you know, in that that same house there was an experience i had where i was uh i won't go into the details but i was in the bathroom and then we had one of these um <laughs> doors that kind of you know slide open uh there there's like two pieces where you pull on it and it there's a, it slides and it kind of is accordion like and there was a little kind of like a, an opening and i looked through there and i saw a woman's face and she had a bandana on and you know at that age I didn't really get scared. I was more confused than anything. And I looked away. And then when I looked back, it was gone. And I'm like, hmm, is that my sister? No, it didn't look like my sister. It looked like an older lady. It didn't look like my mom. My mom never really wore bandanas. So then I even yelled out. I was like, mom, mom, are you here? And she was on the other side of the house. And she's not really into practical jokes. And I I don't think it was my brother. (laughs) I mean, if anybody was playing a joke on me, it's sooner or later, the joke is kind of like, you know, exposed and everybody laughs about it or whatever. But it was just a confusing kind of thing because I saw a face looking right at me. I made eye contact uh, with the face. And it was just the minute I looked away and looked back, it was gone. And it was very interesting. But, you know, it's not something I can really say, you know, that's definitely paranormal. Maybe I was seeing things or whatever. You know, you try to rationalize things a lot of the times when you see things you don't understand. So years go by. And then later, uh, I had the uh, the gumption to go out to Amargosa, do a, an investigation by myself out there. And then the second night, there was a there was a group, there was like a paranormal group that went out there. And I, I met up with them, did an investigation out there. And then from that day forward, I was hooked on doing it as an adult. I bought some equipment. Um, and then just started scheduling things. And, and I joined another group that 
ended up morphing into another group. And then we, we ultimately created Black Seas of Infinity um, out of the experiences we had, you know, previously with those groups. And it's just something that I really love to do because it's like, you know, you go to these different places and it kind of expands your knowledge of the, you know, the area. I, I love history. I love of meeting people and you're, you're out there for a purpose you're looking for evidence you're, you're doing investigations but at the end of the day you're you're also meeting great people and learning about the history of the places that you go to so there's never a time where you lose out on any of that it's always a good it's always up to this point been a really good experience john looking back on that experience when you were eight do you think there's any tie-in that you've ever come across as far as who the woman in the bandana could have been not really no i mean it might have been because it was an older home and it's been around for a long time it might have been something previous that i didn't know about and you know back then being that young i wasn't really i didn't have the facility to like research it the history uh you know there's no cell phones or internet back then so uh so not not really unfortunately i I can't really tie it to anything that i could really you know make a a, an assumption of who it might have been see in in each of our cases really it because I these are always the things that I can relate to the most is the fact of these one and done experiences and you kind of go mm-hmm. well why why was it just this one and done thing did it know that that's all it needed to light this fire was that the whole purpose of it I don't know or was it just a like I for me I just see mine as a glimpse into really something I wasn't really meant to even see to be honest it was kind of like lightning like, striking yeah I totally agree with that I you yeah. know I think our egos get in the way a little bit and we we seem to think we know everything and, and especially in regards to, you know, spirits and paranormal, we base it off of, of course, stories that we've heard and in the experiences that we've had, but we're still learning or it's always going to be a, a, a learning thing for us. I mean, uh, until we die, <laughs> you know, it's till we, you know, until we're on the other side, it's, uh, it's going to be that I growing up as well. I, I, none, nothing in particular myself, but I did live in, in many States, but in one in particular was Tennessee, uh, Nashville area. And a lot of my friends were living in historic homes, you know, old, um, homes that were used in battles and so forth. And they were maybe converted to hospitals and so forth. And I, I'll be honest. I mean, I, you know, some of the very, you know, of course in the Bible belt area there, you know, they're very, very Christian people and, and very honest, and they're not trying to impress you with that kind of stuff. But I just, again, I remember as a young teenager, hearing a lot of stories from my friends and, and their parents, you know, that uh, of uh, actual full body apparitions and things moving in the house. Uh, they, they never really had any contact, you know, specifically, but the stories were just phenomenal. I mean, and all that to this day, that was many years ago, but to this day, I remember them very vividly, the stories and the sincerity when they told them. So again, you know, if you look at, you know, an old soldier that, maybe died in, in the hospital, which is now a house or maybe close by or on the land. Yeah. You know, again, it's a belief, you know, it's, uh, did, are they stuck? Did, were they not able to move on and are they stuck in the spot that they, they died? So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of assumptions. That's for sure. With you guys being from one from Kentucky, the, the Kentucky area, and then another from Tennessee, any, you hear any Bigfoot tales out there? Yeah, oh yeah, I have some great friends. Yeah, I have friends that are just just so very fascinated with you know Bigfoot and do a lot of study. Yeah, and, um, yeah. Matter of fact, uh, one of them was out to visit here in Vegas not too long ago, and yeah, he's told me some pretty pretty interesting tales. And uh, he's he's out searching quite often for Bigfoot. And yeah, it's it's, uh, it's honestly it's something that we haven't we haven't dove into that much, but we are very fascinated with it, and um, we know some history on it and. A lot, again, you know, a lot of different beliefs. John and I were actually talking about this, uh, I believe, last night, knowing that, you know, you, you, you're very much into it. And, you know, just all the different aspects of, of Bigfoot and Sasquatch, you know, it's, it's uh, something we definitely want to get into for sure. Well, for us, uh, being relegated to the Las Vegas Valley, it's a hefty drive to get anywhere that there's going to be high, much <laughs> higher chances of Bigfoot activity. So, yeah, we're, we're a, little, a little stuck out in the middle of nowhere when it comes to Bigfoot. Yeah. Not a lot of yeah. not a lot of trees for him to hide behind. No. Out here. Mm-hmm. Well, I did go up with a couple of friends to Provo recently, and that was our goal is to go Bigfoot hunting because in Utah there's a map and it kind of shows you uh, where all the sightings are. So uh, Provo Canyon was uh, supposedly, well, uh, you know, some really good sightings on YouTube. 
um, I mean, really, really credible sightings that, that, you know, are very compelling and very, you know, interesting to watch. So, uh, me and a couple other guys just went over there and we had some car trouble <laughs> on the way up, but we did eventually get there. And, um, you know, we, we drove around and then we tried to get in the woods, but we didn't really see anything. Um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the distraction was with the car, the battery wasn't doing what we wanted it to do, but we ultimately did get to our destination. Unfortunately, we didn't get any evidence, but we did go look. Uh, so it's definitely on our radar as far as, uh, you know, being interested in it and trying to find some place, you know, in this area of the West to go, uh, go see what we could find. Yeah, that app that I love. And in, in fact, one of my Patreon members, uh, Jake Dressel, and he's a, he's a great guy, knows a ton about Bigfoot, has had his own experiences in Ohio. He's the the gentleman that he and his wife had the Littlefoot in Huber Heights is their episode. And the Bigfoot Mapping Project is an app that he turned me on to. And, it, and like he said, it's like the best $1.99 you're going to spend. Uh, it's just a great curation of all kinds of Bigfoot uh, activity from across the country. And they even have... Uh, Canada on there. So actually, no, the, the more I think about it, I think that he is expanding out uh, throughout the world, but most of it's throughout the U.S. But anyway, sorry to digress into Bigfoot. Everyone's like, of course, she's got to bring up Bigfoot on a, on a paranormal a research app. podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, let me get back on track here. Okay, so the name Black Seas of Infinity is a very unique name. So tell me about that. What does that mean? Where'd you guys come up with this name? Well, I'm a big fan of horror movies and, and, and fiction books and, and just, you know, all kinds of different uh, genres of media of, you know, that deals with like that paranormal and kind of like macabre <laughs> uh, subject matter. Um, so the, there's a book out there called Black Seas of Infinity, and it's a compilation of uh, short horror stories by H.P. Lovecraft. And I just really love the name and, and the quote on our on our website kind of. Um, uh, indicates the reasoning behind it. And, and basically the, the idea is that, you know, we're human beings and we're in this world and we have this, uh, universe that we're trying to figure out. And, and basically, uh, somebody was talking about quantum mechanics. I believe me, I'm not a quantum mechanic expert, but the way they explained it was, uh, just one aspect of it was, you know, you, you know, so much in a certain area. And then when you learn a little bit outside of that area, you learn what you don't know it, because it expanded what you learned. And then when you learn all of what you don't know in that area, it expands even farther. You realize there's more out there that you don't know. And it just keeps expanding, expanding. So into infinity, basically. So that kind of kind of encapsulates what we're we're looking for. We're we, like Spen said earlier, we're constantly learning, we're constantly investigating, we're constantly asking questions. And the more we can push that envelope of what we understand. I mean, it is kind of daunting sometimes when you learn things and you 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 have you have these concepts that you didn't have maybe a few years ago because you learned so much and then you realize how much you don't know and then it's it, it's it just keeps expanding. So the the drive to keep learning is always there, and I think that's really what that phrase, uh, you know, the the quote on our website encapsulates. I'll bring it up here. And you know, in Black Seas, it, it, when we think of that, it it's very haunting in its own way, you know, when you think of being stuck out in the, you know, an ocean in these big angry black seas, you, 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 they, they just will always seem like they go on forever. So, uh, yeah, it was a, you know, it was really an interesting quote and, and, uh, something that we grasped onto. I, you know, I think it, it, it fits us pretty well. So basically the quote is we live on a placid Island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity. And it was not meant that we should voyage far. And again, that kind of encapsulates that whole idea of we're we're very small in this universe, and you know there's a lot to learn, and it just keeps going on forever. And there's you know we're we're out on a boat, and it like Sven said, it's very scary, and a lot of times it's just very ominous. It, you know, so certain things that happen, a lot of the things that we investigate, you know, the 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 places we've been, and the the you know the people we've talked to, and the history there. It's mostly the um, you know these people died a tragic death. Or you know, an ominous, uh, under ominous circumstances, and I think I think uh, Spence made a good point earlier about you know I kind of think about my own life. My parents passed away recently, and they were in the you know that stage of life. They were old. They didn't they didn't get into a car accident. They weren't murdered. They weren't 
you know, killed. And, and, you know, I think if you're younger and you do uh, experience a tragedy that ends your life, there's a lot more energy there that, that uh, can be discovered. And, and again, it's sad and ominous, but we're always striving for the truth and we're, we're striving for knowledge. Every time we have an investigation, we try to be as respectful as possible to, to anything that we may be communicating with. We don't like to make assumptions, but we just try to, you know, get any feedback we can. And we try to use scientific equipment to prove anything we can. And we don't really, when I say prove, at the end of the day, we're going to offer up our evidence and let whoever ever looks at it, make up their own mind. We're not going to tell you what it is. We're not going to say, oh, this is this, and you should believe this. This is just the temperature dropped. The, we, we have this audio EVP that we caught where it sounds like somebody's saying something, and the EMF meter went off. And you add all those together, and then you provide that to the public and say, you make up your own mind what you think this might be. No, that's a great nod to Lovecraft. And Sam Sheeran's going to be so disappointed in me that I, I honestly didn't I, that, I didn't put that together. I had no clue about that. So he's going to be rolling his eyes when he hears this podcast. Like, come on, Jan, you know better than that. <laughs> you should have put that together. He probably got that the second he saw the title of the, the podcast. Well, that's very cool. So we've we've covered even a little bit about Bigfoot and that you guys are interested in it. And it looks like, of course, you do the, you do the ghost investigations. But in the email, you also mentioned you guys have actually been out to the Skinwalker Ranch area a couple of times. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, Skinwalker. It, <laughs> you know, it really wasn't in our wheelhouse at first. And uh, an opportunity arose with Skinwalker. I mean, certainly we were familiar with it and so forth. But uh, we, we, we met somebody that happened to have land that borders the property. Of course, as, as it became, as we all know now, very commercialized out there, it's very difficult through the various owners, the, the few that have owned it in the last, say, 10 years. There's a, there's a lot of high-tech equipment. You know, there's a lot of security, huge security around that place. So it's hard to legally get near that property. And so uh, fortunately for us, you know, we have a, I, we can call her a friend and that it's, there's, there's no dwellings on the property, but it's, uh, I think it's uh, about 18 acres of property that she happens to own and it borders it. it well, let me say this. It, it borders it minus uh, a strip of a tribal land that just, there's about a hundred yards of tribal land that, that separates it. And there is in fact, some wire fencing. Uh, you risk you know, crossing those fences uh, that they they are uh, very strict about being on their tribal land. But anyway, I digress on that a little. But the um, but the fact is is that we we had that opportunity to get right up to the property, you know. And of course, the whole Ute Valley over there, you know, is uh, of course all you know, tribal property or at one point. And, and so, uh, yeah, you know, we've, uh, we did an investigation out there a few years ago, you know, kind of going in blindly. We didn't really know too much what to expect. We put ourselves in some interesting positions. I can say that, you know, just like we do in our, in our paranormal research, you know, we, you kind of, you research during the witching hour, of course. And so when we're out in the middle of nowhere, lining this property, that is highly secure. I mean, they, it's funny because it's pitch black. You can't see a thing. You know, naturally we're, we're using all of our infrared and night vision equipment. And we're, <laughs> we tend to forget that they're, they probably are seeing us pretty clearly their equipment that they have. So they know we're out there. I'm sure of it. But, uh, uh, but anyway, yeah, you know, so the first, the first time out, we, um, you know, we did, we did, a, we were of course measuring, you know, temperature drops and, a lot of audio trying to pick up, of course, looking into the sky, looking for interesting lighting, you know, things and not a lot, you know, the first time it was, it was a little disappointing to be honest. But again, I mean, we're, we're standing out in the middle of these fields with no clue really what's around us other than what we're seeing right through our own lenses of our, you know, our night vision equipment. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll be honest. I mean, even, even in our, for us who we're, say somewhat fearless in regards to putting ourselves in scary situations. <laughs> I, you know, this was a little unnerving, you know, we were, we were, we were definitely a little nervous out there because uh, we, we knew again, we were probably in some areas we weren't supposed to be in, but first time, not so much. A couple of years later, we went, we just went out recently. Uh, I think a few, was it two months ago, John, mm -hmm. or something soon, not too long ago. And just kind of 
picked up where we left off, went to some other areas. We, we did, in fact, you know, see uh, some very interesting anomalies out there and nothing ground shaking, but definitely some interesting lighting formations in the sky and, and even down low, actually. When you go to Skinwalker, is, is anyone that follows Skinwalker knows they have those bait pens out there and, you know, they're certainly trying to draw in whatever might be out there. And uh, so we, we had constant cameras on those, you know, we were looking at the bait pens almost the whole time and uh, not, you know, the first time it was interesting, the first time we saw in one of the bait pens from a distance, you know, we saw something in the bait pen. We don't know what we still to this day can't quite figure yeah, it out. It was some sort of animal. Yeah, it was an animal, but I mean, it was by its shape. We just didn't know exactly what kind of animal it was. And again, it was used, you know, they're, it's, they're putting it out there to, to for something to come in. And of course, because you're hearing all these mutilations, you know, of the cattle and so forth out there. And it's a, quite a bit of that, obviously. And we did see some of that as well. To be honest, we didn't really see much coming into the bait pens or coming up to them. But like I said, I, you know, we got, we did get, we did get a little bit of evidence, you know, in regards to some visual stuff. Audio, there was something interesting audio wise. There was a, a constant, because again, you're out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, there's no airports around, there's no industry around, but there, the first time out, there was a, a constant roaring sound, like almost like a jet you know, that was on the tarmac getting ready to take off, but not actually accelerating. There was this odd uh, roaring. <laughs> we could never quite figure out what the heck that was. You know, it was um, very unusual and it was constant the whole time. Yeah, it had a strange resonance to it. It was it was very weird. We couldn't really put a finger on exactly what it was. But definitely not due to lack of trying. <laughs> you know, we, we did bring out a lot of equipment out there. And, and again, as I mentioned, and as everybody pretty much knows by now, it's become quite commercialized out there. And, yeah, I think we're, we'll probably back off on that one just a little bit. Well, there was that one uh, over the hill, too. We were at our campsite. And uh, it was just these strange radio uh, signals oh, that were yeah. coming across. <laughs> and it was coming over the hill. And if you, were, if you were to go outside our campsite and look where it was coming from, there's nothing there. There's no residential anything there's no road it could have been somebody's car but the weird thing was that the radio stations they were listening to were just random it was just you know 50s music you know and then disco and then mm. you know country music yeah. and it just Salsa, kept going yeah, yeah it was very weird it was like how where's that possibly coming <laughs> yeah, from right. what is that? so i don't know again you know uh, it's not something we can put our finger on and say you know that's absolutely paranormal but it was strange and then Sitting there, uh, you know, the campfire looking up in the sky, I definitely saw some things in the sky that I couldn't explain that were moving around. I, I didn't get a recording of it, unfortunately, but it was just they were very fast. So I don't, I don't even know if my camera could, could have gotten um, a, re a good recording of it. But it was just some things that were moving around in the sky that I normally don't see. And again, not proof of the paranormal, but just, just kind of made me feel like there's something going on out here. There's a lot of electricity, so to speak. Uh, you know, as a, as a describer of like, there's energy. There's something out there. I mean, it's, it's a very interesting place to, to to say the least and and then when you when you couple that with the the ute native american um uh legends of the skinwalker and what that means and the curses that the you know the navajo put on the ute for the skinwalker and that's what they are they're basically witches um from what i understand from everything i've read and learned about they're uh you know they're basically demonic witches that have put this curse and uh, the skinwalkers can shape shift and become wolves and you know, you know the story of skinwalker the original story that i heard was that um the original owners um this massive wolf-like creature came up and they shot at it and it bounced off its chest and so you have the legendary tales of the skinwalker you have uh obviously there's a lot of um talk about um ufo and alien uh interaction out there that's you know hence the bait pens and the cattle mutilations there's just a lot of stuff going on there out there that's unexplainable um so you know when we go out there you know it doesn't necessarily mean that oh hey you know john and spencer out here let's you know liven up the show <laughs> you know so um hey, you never you know, know. You there, you, they, exactly. they might be True. trying to impress you guys <laughs> well, that's true. And, you know, and the, the one thing you, you, you can't forget is that with Bigelow getting involved in it, you know, the ties to the government, there's something. I mean, there's no question. There's something going mm. on out there. I mean, it, it's that's the mystery. But what? You know, what is it? Why? What's the interest with the government taking over that property and out in the middle of nowhere? So, there, you know, again, that's that, that's what draws a lot of people out there. It, it's interesting. The first time we went out. We it was actually it was the same weekend that they did the uh, storm area fifty one thing. <laughs> we were, you know, I told John I said, you know, in in honestly, 
this is a good time for us because you know we had no interest in the that storming the area 51 thing it was kind of a joke in a way I, you know but but we, you know we we realized though that everybody was going to be out there and there wasn't going to be any other investigators you know around this property you know everybody was kind of headed that way so you know we felt like we weren't going to get any interference with other teams that you know that may have some access around the perimeter of the property and there are there there's a few places there's some properties around there that again will in fact for a fee, you know, allow you to camp on the property and then they direct you on certain things. But uh, yeah, it's it, for us, it's, you know, it's again, very fortunate and, and we, we will all, well, as long as she has the property, we will always have access to it. Yeah, it's something we still have fascination for us, but I, I don't know. I, you know, Skinwalker, maybe at some point we might go back out there again, but uh, it's a, you know, from Vegas, it's like a an eight or nine hour drive for us. So mm-hmm. it's, we, we, we typically like to you know stay more in this region, but um, yeah, it, it was it was fun though. Yeah, the, the humming sound has been reported out there. And I think at this point, it's either that strange kind of more paranormal hum that has been reported in other locations, or it's just one of Brandon's yeah. aircrafts firing up. You know, he's got a lot of <laughs> incredible toys, I have to say. I'm really uh, jealous. Maybe, maybe. But it was so <laughs> constant, though. I mean, it just went yeah. on for hours and hours. And so you're right. And it is, yeah, it's in fact what probably everybody is hearing. <laughs> no, but it's hard to pick. Mm-hmm. No, 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 I was just kidding. But <clears throat> that was just me being a cheeky little a-hole about Brandon's toys because I'm so jealous. He's got such nice things. Um, but the the bait pens, though. So you guys, in that instance, you mean to say that you weren't sure if it was the bait that they had put in there on purpose or there was no bait in there and something had gotten into one of the bait pens and you couldn't identify it? It was, base, it was definitely something intentional. I mean, that, that animal that was in there was put in there by someone. Yeah. Um, it's just when, you know, we were far away. So I had a, uh, basically a, a night vision monocular and zoomed in as much as I could, which is actually had a really good zoom on it. So you could kind of see what it was, but it was, you know, you couldn't really make out exactly what the animal was. It was, it looked kind of like a deer, but I, I kind of yeah. knew it wasn't well, a, deer. a small body with plenty a long of deer, neck. you know, yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> living in you know, Kentucky and Illinois. And, and I know what a deer looks like, but, uh, oh. you know, it was very small, had a long neck and kind of a, kind of a longish now. So it did have a resemblance to a deer, but I, I still, at the end of the day, I don't think that's what it was. So darn near a, a not deer, like a, a not deer, essentially. Yeah, right. like it's a deer, but it's not. Right. It's a not deer. Yeah. 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 And it might be, I don't know, maybe it's a mutated deer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing is, is, is the whole concept of that, right? Putting yeah. an animal in there and, yeah. and waiting for something you know, extraterrestrial to come down and do something to Pretty it awful. so you can have your, your evidence. Yeah, Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, that, that actually the Humane Society, I'm sure, isn't fond of that. Yeah, they're loving that. <laughs> right. They're like, I don't care what yeah. the heck is wrong with this thing. Get it out of there. That's really rude. Yeah. Okay, guys? Let's, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. Poor thing. Well, what they're a- trying to recreate what's happening out in the field with the yeah. uh, the cattle mutilations, which is totally fascinating yeah. on, on how that works. I mean, I don't understand that at all. There's no blood. Yeah. Uh, things are surgically removed with the precision of a surgeon. Um, you know, and the the blades, they, and all the stuff that they can do to research it really is unexplainable. And we've seen a few carcasses out there. We just, we did not, they were so decayed by the time we had gotten to them that, that it was really difficult to see where on, on a fresh mutilation, on the fresh mutilations, you know, you can really, you know, they see these precision cuts and so forth. Not, you know, an animal, another animal could never do that. Um, and then of course, all the blood being drained out. It, it was very unusual. The dead carcasses that we, you know, have seen around there, um, I, you know, it's hard for us to tell. You know, we, we would see and we don't know if a, another animal did it or if it was because of the, the uh, you know, level of decay it was in. Right. So, uh, but they're out there. That's for we sure. We did have one surprise, though. We were at our campsite on the first trip up there and, uh, you know, just kind of talking and, um, you know, shooting the breeze. And, and all of a sudden you hear something heavy, very heavy behind us, cracking some some twigs and i'm just thinking what does a skinwalker look like what does a skinwalker look like what is it what kind of a beast is behind me because i know it's heavy i know it's big and then i got up and i have a very high lumen uh, flashlight and i shined it and i saw some fur behind the leaves and the trees and i'm like oh my god what is that is that actually a skinwalker <laughs> and, then, and then sure enough it, it was a wild horse and uh, came out and said hi to us and you know there was a whole bunch of them and it was Really interesting because uh, they, they they weren't shy at all, but they're wild, so you don't want to go petting them and you know acting you know like they're domesticated at all. But uh, and there was a, there was more than one. <laughs> they came walking through our really campsite. Cool. 
Yeah, it was well, interesting. Except John, you know, you know exactly what a skinwalker looks like, right? It looks like a hundred percent whatever you don't want to see in your entire life. Exactly. That's what it's going to look like. Right. <laughs> when I heard that that branch crack, and then I looked through the the leaves, and I saw some fur, I was like, "Oh my god, what is that beast behind me?" <laughs> <laughs> that would that would be scary, though, a hundred percent when you can't see it at first. You know, it's interesting, and I'll just end with on the skinwalker thing with that is, uh, you know, listen, to, I, I, again, you have such a great podcast, and I and I was listening to some of the others, and one, one of them, one of your more recent ones, you know, they were talking about, well, for Bigfoot anyway, you know, when you're going out in the woods and your intentions and, you know, and, and uh, talking about weapons, you know, bringing weapons out there, and you're, if, you, if you have weapons or depending on what your intentions are out there, you know, you might not actually, you know, it might be that buffer that keeps whatever way and you know in our case we're, we're certainly aware of that you know and 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 we're we're you know we're in some wild area you know that we're in so you know when in the middle of the night uh, you know it's it's you know, we're up till three usually maybe four or you know try to get a couple hours of sleep in the tent and uh you know and as john was mentioning we hear all this rustling going around and we we didn't even know there were wild horses out there so wouldn't even have guessed that so and until you see what it is and you just see the glowing eyes and you hear the sound, I mean, it woke us both up from a dead <laughs> sleep and we're like, what, what the hell's going on outside of this? tent?" <laughs> so, you know, I'll be honest with you, we get you know, a little nerve wracking, you know, we did in fact arm ourselves. And, and, um, as it turned out, you know, once they kind of showed themselves up past the trees, but it, I tell you up to that point, what, what we were out there for in the first place, when you're just seeing these glowing eyes and the sound of that, you know, all the noise that was being made, it, it, it puts you on alert for sure. Yeah, your hand might go to your sidearm just a little bit, right. just in case. It does. It does. <laughs> Finger not yeah. on the trigger, maybe, but it's it's nope, going to nope. be close still, to the gun. Still the safety position. In the ready. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm 100% in your boat with that. I am totally fine going out armed. Um, <laughs> if I drinks myself and I don't have an experience because of that, that's oh, that's how it is because I've seen too many live to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, too yeah, many videos of uh, walked out uh, five miles because of a cougar right, you know, in oh. front of your face. No thanks, you know, crazy people. No, no. thanks, guns. Yay. Okay, so yeah. yes, 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 indeed. So how about uh, now? We're we're gonna zip back to, of course, the the ghost investigations, paranormal investigations, equipment you guys utilize, and what are some of your favorites? As far as equipment or, or yeah. some of the investigation? Uh, equipment wise, uh, yeah. I'll let John, John's more of our, our IT guy, so he can talk more about some of the equipment for sure. Yeah, I really like the SB11 uh, Spirit Box. Um, you know, it's got these, it's a dual channel Spirit Box where you can manipulate forward, backward. Uh, the speed of the, uh, it's basically white noise off of like um, radio stations uh, around the area, and they can go reverse forward. And um, that's a really good uh uh, use of of trying to just make communication and then i also have um, the rt evp so it's a real-time evp and you can actually uh manipulate the recording so that you can actually hear it in real time so uh a lot of the evps we get we don't hear with our natural hearing and we we find it on evidence later so the rt evp is really good because you can then out in the field you can review your evidence a lot easier and another one is an app actually it's called echovox and it's pretty popular. I'm, uh, I'm on the Facebook group for Echovox and there's all kinds of people talking about it and everything like that. And so the concept behind Echovox is it's a database of vowels, whether it be adult, children, male, female, and it's just like, you know, all chopped up. There's never really any one word that comes out of this database and it basically just blows it out into the atmosphere so you can use it to try to get any energy that is in the room with you to manipulate it to try to communicate with you. And we've, we've actually gotten some results off of it. So it's pretty interesting when you actually hear some words out of these chopped up vowels that are just being sent out. But that's another thing where you can hear things in real time. And the energy is strong enough, it can manipulate the, those vowels into, into phrases and words. And we've, we've got some really, really good feedback on that as far as gathering evidence and, you know, things that the app can't do. You know, there's things that, that we've heard that the app doesn't do it just does not make words it doesn't it doesn't formulate sentences or phrases but we've heard it come through when we've asked a question and the question was responded with an intelligent response so 
that's a really, really good tool that we use uh, on, on a regular basis. And then, of course, all the, the night vision stuff for, you know, maybe if we're outdoors or even indoors, we have some night vision stuff that we can use. I've got um, thermal IR uh, and, you know, anything we can do to turn the lights off. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of, certainly a lot of EMF equipment as well, that, uh, which we, we'd use quite a bit of it. The EMF readings, it's interesting. One of, you know, we'll get into it. I know it's on the list to talk about, but, uh, you know, when we get into, when we started an investigation, one of the first things that we do once we're past qualifying the person is, in fact, go around the room. You know, we're looking for any outlets that are bad, maybe that are, there's a lot of current coming out of them. So, not, you know, if it's an option anywhere we go, just like any paranormal team, I would assume, is to shut off as much electricity as you can. I, you know, if you can do a complete shutdown and, and go outside and cut off the whole breaker box, that's usually the best. You don't want any interference. You don't want something coming in. So in the in the situations where we, we can't, and obviously you can't always do that, we'll walk around with our EMF meters first. We will check all the outlets. We're looking for any kind of readings coming out of outlets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we want to eliminate, obviously, as much as we can. Get a baseline EMF yeah. mapping of the of the premises. And then we know if something's outside of that. Yeah, that, this is that's, a good start. That's what we're looking for. Yeah, it's a good base. So the EMF, the EMF equipment is, is actually uh, very, very helpful for us, for starters, you know, just to kind of know that we're kind of working with a blank slate. But uh, to be honest, I mean, once you've established that, once you've done that, you're, the readings that you get, on the EMF become much more valuable. You put a lot more credit to them. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's, a uh, with any paranormal team, they'll, of course, they'll be the first to say that, that those EMF meters are, you know, highly used. And EMF in itself is interesting. I mean, we, uh, I won't go into the details of the, this actual investigation, but we, we went to a restaurant out in California. There was these, um, plugins. They had these, this power bar with 5,000 things plugged into it uh, at the point of sale and also at the, where the bar area is. And they had reports that the bartender was feeling, you know, had, had hallucinations and seeing things out of the corner of his eye and, and, you know, very insecure feelings and all this stuff. And we went in there and we put our EMF detectors up to it and they it went off the charts. It was like, I think the EMF detector went up to 700 and it, it just flatlined and everybody, I was like, all right guys, maybe this, there's something wrong with my EMF detector. Bring your, all your EMF detectors over here. And every single one of them flatlined because they couldn't even gauge the the amount of EMF this was coming out and slamming into these people. So ultimately That's we helpful. debunked it. We basically, yeah, I mean, it's uh, electromagnetic frequency is a naturally occurring thing, but when you're, when you're getting hit with it on a very high level, then yes, you're going to have like hallucinatory kind of experiences. You're going to have uh, feelings of paranoia and that's a natural thing. So it's not paranormal at all. And we were able to debunk um, a lot of the stuff in that restaurant. We, 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 you know, filled out a report and we gave it back to them. And I feel like we did a, you know, good service to them. You know, and it's not something I, I don't believe that the health department tracks or anything like that. But, you know, if your electricity well, the, is the fire codes. <laughs> yeah. If you're, but if you're, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think you should be putting all that into a power bar, obviously, because yeah. it was just a ton of stuff. But, you know, the ramifications on the employees were, were detrimental to their psyche mm. at, at some point, you know. So, you know, we're, we're, I don't think we're, I wouldn't call ourselves skeptics, but at the same time, we do want to debunk things and we don't want to run down a rabbit hole and start saying things are paranormal when they're not. And I'll, you know, I'll just quickly hit on that one in regards to that exact thing. You know, John and I, a few years ago, you know, we, we, we lost a, a really good friend to suicide and he, it was interesting because he was and it. Ironically, it just happened to be behind my house in, in the, in the area I live in here in Vegas. And I, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know he was, he was separated from his wife and he was living in this apartment and I didn't know it was him. And there was, before he actually pulled the trigger, so to speak, he, there was SWAT teams and all this activity going on behind my house. And I'm, I'm, you know, so I'm kind of carefully watching it and then come to find out later, you know, who, who, who it was. And so it was a good friend of ours. And so anyway, the, the, his wife, again, who was living in a house down the street, after she came to grips, you know, with things, she still had access to his apartment you know, to get his belongings out of there and, and so forth. And, you know, we're, again, out of complete respect, even with a friend of ours, you know, we, we would stay away from asking, you know, hey, can we, we'd like to try to communicate with them and get the same answers you're looking for, you know. And so we didn't, you know, we didn't do that. But she actually came to us and said, hey, you know, she's naturally, you know, she's struggling with the loss and trying to get those answers. And so she, she actually wanted, she asked us to go in and do an investigation. So we did. It, it was, uh, 
yeah, it's a little traumatic for us. You know, of course, the scene, I'll just leave it at that. The apartment hadn't been thoroughly taken care of, let's say. And so we, you know, we went in there as, to be honest, in this case, it was a little unique for us. This particular one was a little unique because we went in there as friends. You know, we wanted to communicate as a friend, this person. We knew this person very, very well. And so, you know, we, we brought his favorite beer in there, you know, and said, hey, let's have a beer, you know, and, you know, kind of started out that way. Interesting. We, you know, and like I said earlier in this podcast was that often, you know, when spirits are left behind, it's, it's assumed that someone's having a hard time, especially at a younger age. And he certainly was, and someone's having a hard time letting them go, which of course his wife would have trying to get those answers. And so, so we went in there and we weren't getting anything, you know, we were surprised. We thought, you know, wow, this is going to be really a very interesting investigation. We really felt strongly that we were going to be able to communicate with them because we were friends. Nothing. Uh, again, it was a pretty, pretty outrageous scene. And th- towards the end of our investigation, we were sitting in the little kitchenette area, you know, it's a, an apartment. It was an apartment and a uh, little kitchenette area that you would sit at, you know, and outside the kitchen. So we were just kind of going around the, the, the apartment and trying to find spots to do our e, EBP sessions and e, EMF readings. Same thing happened. We, we, we've sat at this kitchenette where he would have probably spent a lot of time, you know, because his kitchen, there was some seating. I'm, I'm not even sure he had a sofa in the place. Um, he, he hadn't been in there that long. And so when we sat at that kitchenette, the, our, we had four different EMF meters and they, every one of them did exactly that thing. Again, they pegged beyond reading and we're like, Whoa, you know, what's going on here. And so we were, interestingly, we were able to track what was going on because you, you know, the, the reading was the strongest on one particular wall that backed up to where he'd been seated. We went outside the building and we determined that the, the power box for the whole entire apartment building was literally right there. It was right behind that spot. And the amount of current that was coming through the walls. And again, these are things that can cause hallucinations and you know paranoia, paranoia and so forth and, and with the circumstances. So we um we recorded all this, uh, you know, naturally. And we to be honest, we never really took it to the next level. It's a because what we did determine was that this is a very dangerous apartment. To be, now, granted, he came in with problems, you know, with mental problems. Um, and so this just would have contributed to it. No question about right. it. You know, the fact that that's probably where he sat a lot and this amount of current coming through there. So it could definitely be a, a factor in, 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 you know, exacerbating the situation he was currently for in. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, I, I, I could almost say regrettably, you know, we didn't really go to the management because the, the, here's the problem. If you go to the management of the building and try to blame, Something like that, especially a paranormal team coming in, they're going to say, first off, who are, who the heck are you guys, you know, and you know what credentials do you have and so forth, you know, what kind of, but to be honest, I mean, I could have called any electrician and, and proven it, you know, I mean, they're using the same equipment we are, that this amount of electricity is coming through the walls. So point is, is that the next person that occupies that place, that problem, you know, have, has never probably been rectified. So yeah, the EMF readings are, are very important, um, you know, to one debunk a lot of things, but when you get a good clean reading before we do an investigation, when we, again, when we walk around and check everything and then you get readings after, especially when you're doing e- e- EVP sessions, when you're doing an EVP session and you're asking a question and say, okay, come near this rampart or, you know, or this, any of these meters, and, and and then they light up right after you tell them to do that, you know, after you've already walked around the room and there's no current coming anywhere and your phones are shut off. Of mm-hmm. course, you don't want any interference from your cell phones. And and when you get readings like that, it, you know, it certainly does lend to it. But there's in fact is something there. So it keeps us going. That's yeah. for sure. Well, I mean, in the residential cases, how do you guys decide which ones you're you're going to research and take on? 
Well, we have a, a questionnaire that we usually submit. A lot of the questions on there are very personal. Uh, obviously, it's voluntary, and uh, all the residentials we do up to this point have been pro bono, so it's all free. It's a free service that we provide. So if you don't want to fill out the questionnaire, then we probably pass on it because, you know, we don't want to waste your time, waste our time, or whatever. So now if you do answer the questions, there's going to be some questions on there that you are voluntarily providing answers to, whether are you taking any prescription medications or, you know, even recreational drugs that might cause hallucinations? Do you have any uh, history of uh, mental uh, disorders or issues like that? Are you currently on some prescriptions, whatever? And again, we're not, it's all voluntary. Of course, we want to adhere to the HIPAA standards of privacy and all that. But if, if they do, and a lot of people don't have a problem with it, you know, because they're not going to tie that to uh, either a prescription drug or, or mental issues, and they're like, no, 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 and they'll fill it out, and then we'll go ahead and do the investigation. But, you know, to be, in, to be honest, you know, that with what connected us you and i and john is going back to the lady that reached out mm -hmm. you know she did reach out you know after i right. responded oh. said okay you know you know we'd love to do an investigation and she she reached out right after i think that same day even said oh i'd love to have you do that and so my next follow-up was, was in fact just what john said i said okay well we, we do have a questionnaire that may ask some personal questions and i didn't really get into what the questions were, but maybe she put the pieces together and never heard from her again. Mm. So, and that's fine. It's, it's, you know, certainly we, we get that, you yeah. know, it's, it's not, it's not unusual, but maybe they don't want to answer the question that might, that they've probably just realized might actually be a factor. And, and so, and that's fine with us. And again, just as John said, we, we'd rather stay away from that in the first place, you know, cause that's something we can't, it's hard for us to, to rule out if in fact they have a history. Right. We're just trying to qualify the, yeah. the investigation to make sure that there's nothing else going on in the household that could contribute to the experiences that they're having. No, that's a necessary evil, no pun intended, to, to get all those yeah. questions out of the way. Questions that Rain Man likes to ask, right? When he likes you, are you on any exactly. prescription <laughs> medications, right? I mean, that that is part yep. of this. And I find that really fascinating, but also really sad about your friend that – Seat, being seated what a PSA I mean being seated against that wall that was his favorite spot to sit and yep. being hit with all yep. that on on a daily however many hours however long it was over how many years would probably have that extra effect on someone that was already in a fragile state or the right. edge actually yeah. so to speak to add that to the the I guess negative interpersonal you know relationships he was going through at the time you know, and he's just, he's, he's trying to cope with all that. And then you add that to it. It's uh, just a lot to think about. Yeah. You know, and this, and again, the sad part about it was, is that, you know, it was on an Easter Sunday and, and I saw this activity and I had no idea that it, it was him. And to be honest, I'm not blaming myself in any way, but I'm just saying is that if I had known, you know, I would have just jumped my wall, which backs up to, you know, Grand Canyon, not the Grand Canyon, but the street. <laughs> You know, I would have just walked up there and said, please, you know, give, like, give me a chance to talk to him. I, yeah. I didn't know, you know, let me, I, why not? Right, <laughs> you know? right. And so, again, I'm not, you know, not knowing yeah, the situation. Was a real shock it did. Knew him. Yeah, it really it was sad. But, uh, but anyway, not to bring this down <laughs> in that sense. But, uh, yeah, you know, so the residential, uh, I'd say we do more residential, but we certainly have done a, a, a quite a bit of commercial, you know, historic sites and so forth mm -hmm. that, that we, we do enjoy doing. I mean, you know, the, you know, Zach and the boys, you know, those guys, uh, again, they, what got them going, you know, I think you put them really on the map was of course their, you know, their Virginia city, the Washu club, the Washu club, you know, their investigation that they did there. And to be honest, I mean, anyone that's actually have seen that it's pretty impressive. You know, it's, um, you know, it is a, in fact, a full body apparition sighting that's recorded and it, the, the, Certainly the film has been tested quite a bit from what we understand and, you know, that to, to not be doctored in any way now. Uh, and if I recall, I think wasn't the Washu club before they started their show. Right. I mean, didn't yeah, that, yeah, that kind of launched? Yes. Yeah, so they yeah. kind of got the launch, you know, launched their thing, but, but which is good. It gives more credibility to it. You know, there's not producers you know, involved telling them what to do, but we've, re we've replicated a few of the, the investigations that they've done. And, and of course that one, you know, that one is, you're going to go for the meat, you know, you're going to go for the ones. And we did a complete shutdown of the wash U club. You know, we had to pay handsomely for that, but uh, you know, we had a full team on that one. I think we had five, you know, guys there and we paid to shut it down, you know, after their tours were over and we locked it down and shut off as much of the power as we can. 
it, you know, it was interesting that particular commercial or let's say historic, I mean, the, the history, you know, behind the Washu club is, you know, John Mackey, you know, of course who founded the town. It's a gold, old gold mining town. And, you know, John Mackey kind of built it and, you know, a lot of famous people were in and out of that Washu club. A lot of them used to gamble, you know, upstairs, they used to play poker, you know, in, in some of the rooms and, you know, Mark Twain and uh, who else was up there. I mean, some really big names, you know, that they, they meet up there and play poker. So, you know, we'd go up and we'd replicate what they do. Be honest that at the, at that particular investigation, you know, this is, you know, two, three in the morning, we're up there and we're sitting at the, at the card table, you know, that they're, and we laying out hands and we'd lay out a hand for, you know, any spirits that were there and say, Hey, you know, join us for playing, you know, we're playing some five card, you know, just join us. And to be honest, that, that, uh, particular one, we, we got quite a bit of EVP evidence, you know, especially through Echo Vox and EMF readings. And, and that was in direct know, relation to a question or something that you guys had said. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And, that, and that's it. I, you know, when you have that, when you get those, that again, that's what gives you the credibility, I think, to it is that when there's nothing going on, you ask a question and then right after you ask the question, your meters go off or, you know, or if you're talking through, if you're, if you're communicating through the echo box and they, and it can manage to actually put together words and, and John's going to get into that in a minute, which again is on our list of one of the top investigations that we've done. But, you know, when you get, you know, when you can get, I don't want to say complete sentences, but when you get very vivid answers through something that's just spitting out vowels and it's, and it's putting together actual words that make sense to your question, it's why we do it. I, you know, it's, it's, to be honest, we all are in this for the same reason is that, you know, we want answers. I mean, just like anybody else, you know, we want to know that it's the billion dollar question that everybody on this planet has is where do we go from here? And so, you know, anyone that, anyone that does the, that does paranormal is looking for that Holy grail, you know, of communication. They want that spirit to, to give, you know, to give some answers, you know, and to let us know what exactly, where, where are you going and, and what, what is it like? And, you know, all these things. And it's, it's very primitive, you know, I mean, it's not, it, it's, it's, and it's, it's the obvious. It's every one of us. It's built into every one of us where it doesn't matter your level of spirituality or whatever. I, you know, even the, the most spiritual person still has questions, you know, about where you go from here. So when you, when we get evidence like that, and sure, there's going to be people that are going to scrutinize it and question it, but we know what we're doing. And to be honest, we do it for us. You know, we're not, we're not actually doing it for anyone else. I mean, we want to give answers to people that are reaching. I don't mean it that way. You know, when people are reaching out to us on a, on a residential level, yeah, we certainly want to e ease their minds as much as possible, but what keeps us going? I mean, it's, it's actually, we want these answers. <laughs> you know, we want, we want just like everybody else, you know, we want, we want to know, you know, we want to know what happens. So it's uh, it's a, it's the drive, you know, it's the drive that keeps us going. Okay, so I would like to go down this list that you sent. You kind of already, you covered the the Washoe Club a little bit. And I would like to close with the attorney story, if you don't mind. So can we go up? It's northeast of Las Vegas. It's uh, Pioch and the Overland Motel. So um, another one, you know, that the Pioch and Overland, that was a, that was a fun trip. <laughs> we, uh, to be honest, we were actually, it, it started as an investigation in Caliente. So if you're familiar with the area, you know, Caliente is what about, I don't know, 15 miles away. And they're both out in the middle of nowhere. There's really nothing out there. And so we, we had, uh, we were invited by the mayor of Caliente to come out and investigate the historic train station in Caliente. And so they suggested, the mayor suggested, well, you know, come out during what we call our Caliente days, which is a celebration they do in the summer. And it's, they had a homecoming. A lot of people from Caliente around the country all come in on that day. Yeah, it was, it was parade. yeah, parades and all that. So they, you know, so they invited, they wanted us to do that. So we took advantage of it, of course, you know, and we, you know, we, <laughs> you know, we, we were in their parade as this paranormal team and it just brought a little extra to, to their, to their, to their celebration. But, and we invited a few, we raffled off a few spaces to come and do the investigation with us. And yeah, so we had, we had a ton of fun with it, but they, the only, only place to stay for us to stay because it was a two day deal was in Pioch. And of course the Overland hotel, which is in fact, one of those that, you know, again, Zach and the team has, has 
done before and, and also is, is in fact had a lot of evidence there mm-hmm. so we we did, we took our families <laughs> you know we we um they didn't know you know we didn't really tell them <laughs> that we were putting them in the overland hotel and that it has a history of being haunted <laughs> and you know we I said like okay it. we're gonna you guys stay here it was great it was all oh, it's to this day it was the best it, you know and because we put them in there not knowing and they've somehow found out, I guess, I don't know if, I don't think they had any particular experiences, but, you know, we would leave them at night, of course, to drive, to do our overnight investigations, mm-hmm. two nights in a row in Caliente. So, <laughs> so I guess after the first night, they, they caught wind of that, that the Overland Hotel and this, and again, total coincidence, but they put us in the rooms that were the most haunted rooms. And so they, they caught wind of this and, you know, we'd come back from our investigation in Caliente at, you know, three in the morning and they're all wide awake. I mean, they're not, you know, there's our kids <laughs> and our wives and they're like, <laughs> like, what the hell are you guys doing putting us in this place? And we're like, well, you know, I didn't mean to, you know, we didn't really realize that. And so, um, and just real quick, uh, when we came back at three in the morning, I looked up at the room that we were staying in when my, my wife and my boys were staying in and the light was on like Spence said they're wide awake Aww. and I went up there and my wife said that my youngest son was out fast asleep and then um, a little bit after we left he just shot up looked at her and opened his eyes and said to communicate with ghosts you have to talk really quiet and then he went right back to sleep oh goodness <laughs> so that free her out so badly. Yep, I'd and be she up with the my lights on too. Yep. Oh, Nick. Yeah, and even when she told me, I was kind of freaked out. I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> Were so you guys in the doghouse I mean, a little bit after this weekend? Uh, I'm just bit. wondering. Yeah, I, I, think you could, I think you could say that. Uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, but uh, you know, going back to what we got out of it, I mean, we didn't we we didn't do an investigation in the Overland. That's just how, where we happened to be staying. It was one of the only hotels available because there were so many people in town for these Caliente days. And so the train station was fascinating though. And, um, and again, I mean, we, and I, who was the resident spirit there, Fred, or what was the guy's name? Oh, I can't remember. Everybody name, knew yeah, him. Yeah. I mean, they, 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 they could actually communicate. I mean, there's multiple people that knew, Oh, that's Fred in the train station right. or and whatever. We, were, we went down into the bowels oh, of the train yeah. station and there was like <laughs> holes in the wall that we were creeping. Through. Oh yeah. We're climbing through, you know, you know pitch dark and in, in, in the, in this station, that's what uh, 150 years old or whatever. And, cobwebs and you're crawling no telling what you're walking through and you know again they there was so much history on this guy that walked the hallways of this train station and i and again the names passed me by but the um but that's what we were after and you know i i don't i don't recall that one being a uh huge I, i'm sure we got a yeah, little bit we didn't bit. capture a lot we did I, I i do remember us um noticing one orb and typically we like to debunk orbs as far as like dust moisture just you know natural things that cameras pick up that your eyes may not be able to see, but there's certain orbs, you know, not only the stuff that we've recorded uh, in our history of investigations, but stuff I, you know, see on YouTube or whatever, where they're very compelling. You're like, okay, normally I I don't give credence to orbs, but this one that we noticed at the train station did seem to have a certain trajectory and a kind of a mind of its own. So it was, it was pretty interesting. And when I see those, then it lends a little bit more credence to that might be attached to some sort of energy around, you know, the area that we're investigating in. But a lot of the stuff I see online, I'm like, nah, I'm just like, no, that's, that's, I don't believe that that's a real orb when people are claiming, I think there's an over claiming going on when it comes to orbs. Like, Oh, look at this picture. It's a bunch of mist. Yeah. It's a mist. (laughs) It's dirt. (laughs) It's bugs. It's whatever. Yeah, you're right. It's, but it's not like paranormal. But then again, when I was in, I, I investigated Amargosa, but this wasn't my recording. I saw a recording on YouTube about Amargosa, and it was the same theater that I had investigated, and there was an orb coming out of the sky, and it went through a wooden chair. So that is interesting. That is a <laughs> some some compelling evidence when it comes to what an orb might be. I like the videos where it's it's a spider on a web, and it, it looks yeah. very strange, but those yeah. have been going around quite a bit since the yeah. proliferation of ring cams and things like that. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, so the last one I, you know, I know that you'd like to talk about it, and I'm gonna let John tell this one. This is uh, this was probably one of the most fascinating uh, invest residential investigations we've ever done. Yeah, so um, it's basically a friend of mine. It was her mother, so she asked me because I was over there. We were celebrating something, and uh, we were in the backyard talking. And she said, you know, I know that you guys do uh, paranormal investigations. My mom's house is haunted, and I'm like, wow, really? 
so she asked if I would mind going over there. I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> I'm like, this is what I live for. And, and, uh, so I met with, uh, uh, I met with her and, um, kind of uh, wanted to kind of like do a preliminary question, the question with her. I didn't really want to submit the, the questionnaire, but I did, you know, and, and, but she was through a friend. So I met with her at Starbucks and she provided a CD for me and I asked her, you know, a lot of questions about the house and her experiences. And she says she gets EVPs all the time. She's been recording this stuff for years. She has piles of salt at every door. She has a cross on every window. She burns sage all the time. And I asked her, you know, and I believe you asked her the same thing when we, we showed up was, you know, what do you want to get out of this? You know, do you want us to corroborate that there is paranormal, you know, activity? You know, so she's like, no, not at all. I, I know fearful. there's paranormal. She's like, I don't, I don't need you to prove to me that my house has paranormal entities in it. All I want is like, what's the backstory? Why are they here? I already know they're, they're here. She was convinced. And, and let me just say, she's, I, not she's, like a, a, well, she's a prominent attorney. We obviously we can't say her name, but the she's handled a. I'll put it this way: she's handled cases that all of us are familiar with. Right. She's very probably same, in the country. Incredible <laughs> person. And you know, even even when we said that we would be doing a lot of recordings, you know, she she mentioned her office, and she's like, "Well, there's stuff in there I do not want." online i'm like absolutely you know no we won't put anything online until we pass it through you you know because there's kind of confidential information about some of her clients and stuff like that so she was a criminal she is a criminal defense attorney so we went over to the house well actually before that let me uh, preface uh, right before we went the actual investigation the cd she gave me had about five evps on it and then she named them what she thought they were saying so she gave me the cd when i met her at starbucks and i took the cd home i put it in my computer listened to it and i sounded exactly like the things that she said it was sounding like, but then I wanted to clean it up some more with the software that we use, get the, you know, some of the artifacts out of it and the, 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 some of the white noise and clean it up and kind of accentuate whatever, whatever voices are being heard. And one of them was called the, it was called, there are two of us. And again, she named these files uh, after what she thought she heard them say. So I, I listened to that one without cleaning it up and, and you can hear a, a deep male voice and you can hear it say, there are two of us. And I'm like, wow, that sounds exactly like what she thought, you know, said she heard it. So then I put it in the software, cleaned it up. And then, and then you could hear, once it was all cleaned up, you could hear the male voice. And, it, you know, it said, there are two of us. And then right after that, it, it sounded like a very light female voice that you could barely hear. But it said, there are two of us. Like that. She never heard that before. I took it back to her. And she was like, oh, my God. And it kind of makes sense. There are two of us. There's two right. people on that recording. There's a, there's a male and a female voice. And, but the one was so light. And you, but when you put the headphones on and it's all cleaned up, you could definitely hear it was there. And there was another one uh, real quick. I'll just get, get to the other one before I talk about the actual investigation. There was another one where the, the name of the file was I Don't Like You. So she had these dogs at the time. And she would put them outside when she would leave. And then she would just sit, set a recording on the table and just let it record all day. So then she would come back and find, you know, whatever she heard. And this one was, I don't like you. And she said, even when she was at home, if the dogs that were in the pen, if they started barking, she could never get them to shut up. You know, she was just kind of like, shut up, shut up. And they would, they would just ignore her. It might be something outside, the car or whatever, uh, triggering them. And they would just bark and go crazy. So then on the, the actual audio, and I cleaned it up too, and, and you could hear the dogs. There's, I think there was three in the pen. And they're Rottweiler and a Doberman or whatever. And they were like, rah, 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 rah. and then... All of a sudden, you hear this voice. While they're barking, you hear this little girl's voice go, I don't like you. And they all shut up. Mm. All three dogs went silent. And about um, uh, uh, one and a half seconds later, you hear <laughs> like somebody kicked the dog. Oh, geez. Yeah. And it was weird. It was like this voice is so creepy when you listen to it. It's just like, I don't like you. And then, bam, they all went silent. And then two seconds later... You know, like something bad happened to the dog. I don't know. I, I, you know, it obviously didn't die or anything like that, but something, it sounded like, like somebody kicked it, kicked the dog. So, so I had that and I'm like, wow, this is pretty good stuff here. And there was come a, a couple other files, but then we had the investigation and we went over there. I think we got over there at like, I don't know, 11 o'clock. Uh, we wanted to go through midnight and we want to go through 3 a.m. 3 a.m. is like Spence mentioned earlier, the the kind of accepted witching hour in the industry. And, and we asked the question, I was like, well, if it's 3 a.m. here, you know, and it's not 3 a.m. somewhere else, how does that work? Yeah. And I guess it's just a window of time that wherever you're at, if it passes over 3 a.m., that's when activity goes through the roof uh, for certain people. 
multiple certain times, certain investigations. So we definitely want to span that time on our investigation. So we were there a long time, but we sat down with uh, with uh, the client and then her daughter. Even the daughter had stories about her mother and some of her abilities. We We feel like this person had some sort of extra ability, maybe some clairvoyance about her because uh, one of the stories her daughter mentioned was she was in San Diego. It was around Christmas. She had asked her daughter to check on the house and check the mail and her daughter kind of blew it off. She was like, man, I'll do it when I want to do it. And then it was, I think, Christmas Eve. She went to bed and she had this image that her house was being robbed. So then she called her daughter the next day. You say, you know, have you gone over there? And she's like, well, no, I've been kind of busy. I'll go over there today. So she goes over there today and sure enough, the house was robbed. So people were broad daylight. People were just open the door and like hauling things out of her house. So, you know, for, for those kind of the stories that come back kind of gives us an idea that there's might be something about her that you know, she has some ability. So then we would go through the house, uh, every single room. We mostly used the echo Vox. We used the SB 11 spirit box too, but the echo Vox, we were in the living room. And the backstory on this is, is there's a guy named George in her house and he has a romantic attachment to her because she has EVPs saying, I love you. I'm here for you. I want to protect you. And then there's the EVPs with the girl. So uh, we were in the living room. Spence was sitting on the couch next to her, just kind of a little bit of a provocation saying, do you mind me sitting so close to her? And the Echo Vox app said, yeah, stupid. And then it came in just like that. And I'm like, did you hear that? And everybody's like, yeah. And we replayed it back. It was like, yeah, stupid. Like right after he asked that question. So George apparently might have been a little jealous yes. <laughs> you know, about the proximity of the seating arrangements. So uh, we were there for a little bit longer. And then our, our client basically explained that her office has the most activity. So we ended over there. We had, we'd gone in there before, did some research, came back out, and then we're ending in her office. You know, I said, okay, let's do maybe 20 minutes regular EVP where we'll listen to it later. You know, it's just all it is is a recording device and you're not going to know anything until you listen to it later. And then after that, we'll do maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes with the Echo Box. So we did the, the regular EVP. Um, again, that doesn't really give you the, the real-time feedback that you're going to need. It's something that you, you go over your evidence later and find out, you know, if there's anything on there or not. So then we did the Echo Box and instead of 10 or 15 minutes, we were there for almost an hour wow. because we were getting feedback. So I'm asking questions. I'm saying, George, George, please push through. If you have any energy at all, please use that energy to push through. Please just say, hi, I'm George. Just say hello to us. Say, hi, I'm George. And then you hear, hello, I'm George. And it came through the Echo Vox. It was amazing. Wow. And yeah. Yeah, one, our, one of our uh, uh, team members were, it was in the kitchen. And he's like, I heard that. I mean, he even heard it from the kitchen. So then, you know, when you get a, an intelligent response like that, it's not like, he said giraffe or Corvette or, you know, things that don't have anything to do with what you just asked. Then you're like, oh, wow, we're onto something here. So we, I started going down this trail of questioning to make a longer story shorter. <laughs> the, the feedback we were getting, everything that we got was, was leading towards a narrative that this person was, was incarcerated. Um, he was abused. There was a lot of uh, responses about rope and choke and police and all this stuff. And, and I didn't really put it together while I was listening to it. Um, but, you know, that kind of lends into what she is. She's a criminal defense attorney. So it's all part of the, you know, the, I guess, the system of corporal punishment or whatever. But there was one where it came in so clear. And, and I was asking all these questions. I'm like, George, what happened to you? Uh, and then you hear 12 white men. And I'm like, oh, my God. It was like a lightning bolt wow. went through my spine. And that app can't do that. Like I said, the app is just a bunch of chopped up vowels going blah, 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 whatever. And then you hear 12 white men. And then she said, look, that's a jury. Yeah. Back in that time. Yeah. Yeah. Back in that time. Yeah, that is so we didn't know what time what was. it was. So that kind of gives us a, a sense An of era. time. It told us the era. Right. It told us that he was, you know, not white. And, right. Yeah. yeah and today you couldn't get 12, 12 white men on a jury and you, you wouldn't want that. You want diversity of opinion and, 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 you know, historical background and whatever. And you want a good, fair jury. But back then, when he said, when it came through and it said 12 white men, well, I'm like, oh, my goodness. When I never really thought about, like, race or, or anything like that. So then I asked the next question. I said, George, are you white or are you black? And then clear as day, I'm black. So now we've got a lot of information, right? So we have all this information. We know it's George. He's already started talking to us. He's talked about a jury. Uh, he's talking about police. He's talking about being incarcerated with rope and choke and he maybe maybe he was guilty of something and they sent him down the river to you know 
or maybe they just did it because of some racially you know charged reason uh we don't know but we but all of it seems to build this narrative that is totally related to what she does as a living so then we were thinking about maybe the possibility i mean we can't prove any of this but we were saying, well, who knows, maybe because she, as a criminal defense attorney, she would go down to the, the cells and the, the jails right. and well, talk that, to she people. She had a lot of death row. She represented a lot of death row. Inmates. Right. Mm -hmm. So maybe there was an entity in a cell somewhere and saw her and attached right. itself to her and came home with her. So we don't know, but the, that's what it kind of seems like. And then with the girl, she's got EVPs where there was a, a situation where she put a doll on the chair for the girl. And the EVP came back later and it was George and he goes, the doll was bullshit. Sorry, excuse my French, but that's what it, that's what it said. The doll was bullshit. And she's like, wait a minute, why? And then, and then over the time, the EVPs that she was getting, I mean, think about the dogs and somebody kicked the dog. Well, she also said that George showed up on, like, she was a single woman and, you know, and had, would have boyfriends over and so forth. Uh -huh. And she said that on two occasions, George showed up and both boyfriends ran out the door. Oh, right? She didn't boy. really get too much into it. Right. Yeah. So, so whatever it is, I mean, you know, again, she's a very credible person. As many times as we've interviewed her and talked to her, I mean, she certainly wasn't drinking or no, no. You know, she's, she's yeah, uh, you know, yeah, very level headed. Not looking for fame or fortune no. or any of that stuff. And the thing with the girl and George was we surmised after we'd gotten all the all the EVPs that we've listened to, not only the ones that we got, but the ones that she's been recording for years, that George is a barrier between a malevolent entity that is the girl. So the girl is younger. And, and you know, you hear a lot of stories about that where, where I, you know, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's demonic, but the, the, the demonic evidence that other groups have kind of gathered have always said that a demon can disguise itself as a young child to draw you in. Oh, it's a young child, you know, yeah, let's, let's try to communicate with it. But I don't, again, I don't think it's maybe ne necessarily demonic, but it's a, it's a malevolent entity that George seems to protect our client from. Yeah, I think it's just a pissed off non-demonic <laughs> spirit. Right, you know? right. I mean, he didn't like that. We, we, you know, and again, I, you know. Well, not we, George is demonic, but the girl. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, George was just upset that, you right. know, we were playing with him, I think, a little bit. And we, and we sh probably should have done that. Well, and George is keeping uh, living, breathing, possible suitors away from this woman. That, that would probably take me off a little bit. I don't know. And one of the guys was like, she explained, he was a big, you know, he, alpha he, male metro police, police officer. officer. Yeah, if I remember right. Yeah, he so, ran I mean, out. Yeah, these big boxes. Yeah, yeah he, he was in the door. bathroom, and I, he, she said something about the mirror moved or whatever, and he, oh. he, like, he never saw him again. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I'm sure she probably, again, had maybe mentioned that she had these issues or dealing with the spirit you know and, and, and again she, she was an attractive woman and I'm, I'm sure these guys were willing to overlook you know some of these <laughs> stories that might seem a little outlandish but but yeah i mean to, you know to hear these you know big grown macho men running out the door right there's got to be something to them yeah i don't yeah, mean to, i don't mean to, to laugh her. at that it's just more, you know one of those yeah it's a it's a knee-jerk reaction you know this big tough guy yeah. he's just <laughs> and one one sad thing is uh you know when this all started happening she didn't know what was really going on. So, and then yeah. over time, she was recording everything. She had video, she had audio and all this stuff. And then at some point in time, she felt that her actions were drawing them in more. So she stopped it and she actually got rid of a lot of evidence, which uh, that's the sad part. Um, and then she started going to church regularly and then doing the, the crosses on the windows and the salt and the sage. But then as time progressed, she actually got comfortable with it. And now she's like, she doesn't want them to leave. She, she's so, so used to having them around that she's not afraid of them. She, she's gone back to kind of doing some recordings and, and she's been sending EVPs and they never end. I mean, even she, she, uh, she moved to California there for a little bit and uh, was uh, uh, in a cabin, a nice cabin out, uh, out in, the, in a nice rustic area. And she said the EVPs continued there. So mm. it wasn't necessarily tied to the house. Well, and she had it as, you know, again, back to that next door app. I mean, if, if you, if you, have you followed that very much, um, you know, it, it's, it turned into quite a, you know, quite a story, but you watched all these responses of all these people that have just telling their stories and, you know, how they're, they're comfortable with these spirits and they're not, causing any problems i mean you're seeing it both ways but you know certainly was a lot of people you know responding that way say oh yeah we have a we have a spirit and you know we've just come to live with them and it's or her you know and it's it's a it's a non-issue but so it's true right you know it, it could go either way um you know but demonic of course has always been more of a physical type of experience often uh where somebody's getting pushed or scratched or 
something along those lines. And naturally, we're you know, we're not trying to draw up your drum yeah, up. Yeah, thankfully you know. that's never happened to us. Yeah, yeah we're you know, we kind of stare. You're like, hey, up. George, come on over to my house, buddy. Yeah. Let's do this. <laughs> right. Like, no right. thanks. Yeah, but the uh, the feedback that we got from George that night was was pretty insane. Yeah, best ever. That's the first. I think the the one of the first. Um, maybe the only investigation where I literally felt like a lightning bolt shot through my spine when I heard that come through because they, they, the app just can't make yeah, those. Words. It was yeah, undeniable. I, you know, to be honest, it's, it, when, that's what I was saying earlier on is that, you know, when you can get something like that, that's just blowing out a bunch of vowels and can literally not, not just put out words, but answer your question. Right. I mean, it's, there's answers. no, it's not a coincidence. Uh, you know, I, a lot of things are, especially in paranormal. And that's a big part of what we do is we come in and we'll debunk things and, and and to be honest, and I'd say maybe more often than not, we do that. You know, we come in and we explain, you know, where this light's coming from or why this thing's moving, you know, or whatever it is, you know, and, and more often than not that we debunk it and say, you know, this is this and this is that. And again, you make your own conclusion, but this is what we've discovered. So, you know, when you get these kind of things, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's great. Whether or not the little girl is just a dog kicking little a hole or a non human <laughs> entity, right? Like something demonic. Do you think that, you know, is it chicken or the egg? Like, did, did, was she kind of always hanging around? And then because George came around, she was like, oh, hell no, this is my, this is my area. And, you know, I hate every, everybody and everything and the dogs too. Or did this attorney, get this spirit attachment, George came around, and then it creates kind of like a spotlight where other things are like, hey, look what's going on down here. Maybe I can go live here for a while. I, I believe that George came first. I believe George was interacting with uh, with our client um, for a while before the girl started also interacting. I do wonder about that that little girl, though. I mean, most little yeah, girls don't go around strange. just... Yeah. Kicking yep. the dogs and whatever else is uh, going on. Has she ever <laughs> captured anything on on video that, that scared yes, her? I've, I've, I'm glad you asked that because she has a very, very good video of a ball of light coming out of the concrete floor in her office. Mm. And it's just it's just slowly manifests and goes right through the ceiling. Yeah. And there's nothing there. It's just, it's just a concrete floor. There's no reason for any of that to happen you know naturally yeah and not to be mistaken for an orb in any way you know no, whatsoever. when you hear that round little light that's of no course, this that's is a big think. glowing yeah. force of some nature that yeah. came out of the floor and went right through the ceiling and because she's got some cctv uh, uh, cameras around her house and she caught that and she has a couple other videos too oh she got the good cameras in she doesn't she doesn't have the the cameras like the, ring. the, the rest of us have like the ring cams you know they're, <laughs> they're a, l- yeah. a little on the lower end there but so in relation to that video, because that sounds pretty striking, do, does she recall that around that time or maybe even that specific day or night that, that something significant happened on recorders or something that she experienced in relation to that? No, it's uh, for the most part, it's all random, really. There was never any line of uh, you know correlation when it comes to you know a certain time of night or a certain event or anything like that. It was just always kind of like... She, you know, just like nakedly left the recorder out running all day long. And then she just gets back and she, she hears all these EVPs and then she'll have other ones too. When she's there, she'll be just walking around the house. Well, I better start the recorder and then the recorder. And then she'll just have tons of them. I mean, more than I've ever seen anybody in my life. And, and then even after the investigation, some time passed and I kind of touched base with her and I'm like, so is everything good? Is, is it still continuing? And she's like, oh yeah, here, here's like. 10 EVP. That's really, that's really something to get used to though. I mean, that I don't, I don't think a lot of people could, could roll like that. Well, well, you, I guess she probably sees it as what's her option. You know, I mean, especially you know, if they're going to follow away. you, right? I mean, what do yeah, you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, but you know, and you know, and I guess like you were saying, if, I mean, if it's scaring boyfriends away, then you know that's a problem. Right. But flattering in the sense that you know maybe he fell in love with her, you know, maybe you know he connected with her. And again, we believe based on the twelve white men. I mean, we see this as a different era, right? And you know, so what we did learn was that she did visit uh, again a lot of you know death row inmates in a very very old prison in california that dates way back yes and so you know our our assumption was in fact that 
that's probably where George connected with her. Mm -hmm. You know, was he was probably in that prison somehow. I imagine at the time, you know, so you have a, a, a attractive attorney coming in and visiting. It, yeah, draw, think, it draws attention, <laughs> you know, I'm sure, in a prison. So, uh, yeah, it's, I think it's where it started. And when we did our actual investigation, that's when she mentioned she was comfortable with him. But I do remember uh, you know, when I said I, I reached out to her sometime later and she provided all these EVPs, it almost seemed like she was exhausted and she was done with it. She was kind of ready for it to stop, but it just won't. Yeah, and that's... And I'm not making light of this at all because honestly, for me, just putting myself in her shoes, this would be a frustration. So it's like, is that second mm -hmm. or third date talk? You're like, well, look, I really like you, but I have kind of roommates that I need to explain right. that I <laughs> live with. You know what I mean? Like, how do you have that conversation with somebody? Because it sounds mm -hmm. like it's inevitable that they're going to experience one of these entities at some point. You just asked the metro officer. I mean that that I mean that affects her her life. It really does. Really, yeah. It actually the 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 effect it has on her life changes things that you know could lead down a different path that right. now can't because of the the effect it's had on 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 her interpersonal relationships. Right. I mean, really, though, but part of me, and this is totally a joke, of course, but I'd be like, ah, who needs you? You're going to run out at a, a, a tiny little thing in the mirror, just spooks you a big deal. Coward. Boo hoo. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I mean, I think if you take charge like that, you're right. I, if you control the situation, you know, and again, it, that's where fear comes in. You know, if you're fearful of it, then it controls you. Absolutely. But, um, but you know, if you, it's funny, we get asked all the time, you know, like, what, aren't you guys afraid of doing this? And you know, why do you do it? And, you know, are, are you afraid? I'm like, no, I, you know, what, what do I, I don't see a, you know, I don't see a spirit harming me. You know, I don't know what they could do to me. You know, I mean, a, a, a mm. demonic again, it's physical, you know, you certainly see hear and see a lot of that, but we're, we're not after that. And, and maybe a lot of paranormal teams might, you know, they might try to go after that kind of excitement <laughs> if they want to call it that. Uh, but, you know, for us, no, I mean, it's all, it's, it's simply, you know, to communicate that we, we really would love to be able to, you know, to say, Hey, you know, we've got this amazing communication with somebody in an afterlife, you know, and, and that's, it, you know, it's, it's truly what it's all about. And, and, yeah, um, and at the end of the day, it's truth and knowledge about the universe. Yeah, of course. Yeah, which is endless. But that being said, if, when we're talking about this "quote unquote" little girl, and we're assuming that she is, but what if she's not? Do you guys go into any location with you know saying any anything protective or or doing anything prior to going in or or leaving and being very fragile with the situation oh. and leaving it there so you don't take it home? Well, there's the common things, you know. Of course, with that said, you know, naturally to going in, yes, you know, we we when we we always start with an EVP session. And just to, to come in and say, you know, hey, listen, we're, we're not here to cause any trouble. We're we're just trying to learn, you know, you know just, love yeah, just, yeah, love and respect. And, you know, just try to really come in with that direction. And then, uh, again, as uh, when anybody leaves these things, you know, of course, we do the sage. And, and we tell them know, we cannot you cannot come home with us. Follow us. Yeah. It's, you know, you are not allowed to connect and, and uh, come home with us. And like you said, burning the sage. It's, <laughs> it's a ritualistic kind of thing, but it's still something that, you know, is recommended. Until you get home. Yeah. And then each one of you yeah. are lying in your beds <laughs> and you hear, I don't like you. <laughs> You're no. like, <laughs> let me tell you something. I, you know, what's interesting is that you do question it sometimes, you know, like when wait, I'll be honest, I mean, ever since we came out of Skinwalker the second time, even Skinwalker, we, you know, we still sage and do all that, you know, our ritual that we do leaving. Yeah. You know, I, I, I run a big distribution company here in Vegas and I, and I'll tell you, it just seems like there certainly has been an awful lot of rash of issues you know, uh -oh. since that time really you know i mean not not completely controlling but you you hear these you hear this all the time you know where you know sometimes they'll connect and a lot of bad things you know especially with skinwalker you know you'll hear that a lot you know things connect to you and they they follow you back and then a lot of negative bad things happen and um i'm not again i'm not it's not ruling my life but it's just more than the normal <laughs> you know certainly more than than average things uh, you know, I, there's not much I can do about it. You know, I don't dwell on it per se. I just deal with whatever comes up, but, um, it, it just, and it could be coincidental, but mm -hmm. it, it does seem to be pretty 
pretty regular. See, if, if that stuff is tied in, if you're going off of, uh, any, we do, as you say, you hear this a lot, like more of the bad luck or your curse might be too strong of a word. But in some situations, that's what it seems like. That aspect of it would piss me off more than anything because to me, I'd be more like Zach. I'd be like, show yourself. Don't be a, you know what? Like, don't just make me have bad luck. Like, I want to see you in the mirror. Right. Like, bloody marry this thing. I don't know. Bloody. Like, does, I, that, the bad luck stuff would piss me right off off yeah i and i don't know if i want to call it man i guess there could be a little bit of bad luck but you know again i you know I, i'm not what zach and them do it's great and their show they've become very successful with that and i think they certainly capitalized on it somewhat and and uh so, so some of it and is maybe a little dramatized but but overall i mean it it, they, it still inspires us obviously we've done some of the same investigations that they've done and so it's just you got to do it for the right reasons. I mean, you know, you got to really, your heart's got to be in it, not necessarily to capitalize on it, but to get the answers that we, you know, truly are after. Yeah. And to run screaming out of a bathroom. I mean, that's what we're all in this for. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Amen. I mean, you know, Amen to we're all looking for that, man. That Metro officer yeah. is it just had something happen that I've been waiting for for 42 years. Not right. happened yet. <laughs> and, you know, but imagine the stories he's telling his friends. Uh, yeah. you know, I mean, that's just, it just keeps going, you know, it just, wow. Yeah. It's amazing. And then he shares it and then he's immediately regretful because they'll never live that down. Well, uh, they'll never live it down. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then the stigma continues and no one shares their stories with us and blah, blah, blah. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> before we talk about your upcoming podcast, that's going to be happening here. Hopefully shortly, I'll be looking forward to that. Let's, let's go to up to Tonopah, Nevada and talk a little bit about that area and the documentary that you guys are going to be uh, putting out. Tonopah, again, another, another one, you know, it's another one that was certainly um, a big commercialized historic investigation and uh tonopah we we've had a blast we've done it we've actually we we've done it twice we've gone up there two times we went up there initially for anyone that might be familiar with tonopah and the history behind it you know there's the mitzpah hotel built in 1907 at one point it, it's a five-story hotel at one point it was the largest actually it was the largest dwelling on the west coast you know in its time and then the clown motel which came much later ultimately in this cemetery, which is right next to the clown motel. So we invested, well, well, we researched it a lot before we went up and did that. And uh, we, we talked to, before we went up, we talked to the the management of Mitzpah and, you know, said, listen, you know, here's what we're interested. We learned a little bit about it, but then we, you know, said, Hey, we'd like to come up and do this in Vegas. And we did that also with the clown motel. The Mitzpah is, you know, of course, very historic and, famous for the lady in red as anyone might know that follows it it was at that point we decided okay you know let's make this one a documentary and um let's you know film it with that in mind and so we of course stayed in the rooms you know that were you know known for being most haunted and we had it all scheduled out pretty well interviewed all the employees that have had experiences uh the clown motel same thing you know it's a uh haim is the uh owner now of it he's owned it for a few years now but uh yeah it was uh it was a really well organized investigation and with the mitzpah you know on the first time we did it we were able to cover actually the the you know the first floor up but the basement had you know an awful lot of activity down in the basement through the years and we weren't able to go there for the first investigation because it was they were doing some construction sure. work underneath there, so we couldn't quite you know get there. So they said, all right, that's fine, you know, because again we were filming everything and, and interviewing a lot of people. So we went ahead and did what we could. We did, you know, we got we did. In fact, <laughs> the the thing is with in in these investigations is the review, and of course anyone will tell you that. You know, when you're when you've got five different cameras set up and four audios and you know all these things and they're running for hours and hours and hours the the tedious part has always been the review <laughs> you, know, you got to come back you know you don't you don't review it there of course you bring it back and you sit in an office or at home or whatever for many many hours of each one of those cameras so you know we we've collected quite a bit of evidence and and interesting like john said and any, again anyone will tell you in this industry is that most of most of the evidence that's captured is is not to the naked eye or you know or, or you don't hear it necessarily right then and there you it's always on your recorded reviews 
so when we did the actual investigation, we didn't, we weren't getting a lot of in your face type of things. We did, we did get some pretty interesting stuff while we were there uh, in the midst, Paul. But it was when we came back and, and working on this documentary to, you know, to put some of the evidence on the documentary is when we are being blown away by what we've captured. And, and again, we've been working on this for months. You know, as I mentioned, what John and I both are, you know, we, you know, full time employees. So we we find hours in the evening to do our review. But uh, the Clown Motel, the Clown Motel was interesting because it's a novelty. Uh, you know, they they do, of course, play into having all these creepy clowns and the, in the, you know, the fact that so many people are you know, really freaked out by clowns, which are supposed to be happy, you know, but, but they become creepy, you know, and right in our room, they had the clown from it. Yeah. So like the room that we were <laughs> yes. in, yeah, like on the, the bed, yeah, we had two beds in there and I, the one I'm at had the big it clown looking right down on the bed I'm sleeping in. And yeah, I forget John had something over his and, and, uh, but regard the point was, is that the, at that, that one by far, had the most EMF readings we've ever had um, anywhere. And we really weren't expecting it at the Clown Motel because, again, there's a little bit of a novelty. They do play into it. Come to the Clown Motel, it's haunted, um, and people will go there just for that. And not really, you know, not ne not necessarily investigators like us, but just, you know, anyone would go there just to say they stayed there. You know, I braved the Clown Motel, and I, I managed to stay all night, you know, just to be able to say it. But to be honest, we we stayed in again the room that the owner told us had the most activity. And uh, I remember when we checked in, we were checking in, and the people who were in that room were leaving. Oh, yeah. and they said that yeah. they had some experiences. True, in there. true, yeah. So they, yeah, we came in right as they were walking out. And so during the day, you know, we John, John and I, you know, we ton of ton of equipment. You know, I mean, we're just bringing in all kinds of stuff, and uh, we were testing equipment and putting all fresh batteries because as we know you know these things drain batteries like crazy energies do and so we we did we did what we said you know we walk around the room and we check in outlets everything was clean there was there was for such an old hotel there really wasn't any current coming through anything really and so we started an evp session and i you know we've got great recordings of this we we it's it's amazing I and mean, we had so many meters running right. And ram pods and things that can detect energy. And we went around the room unplugging everything, everything literally was, everything. They had a little room. refrigerator in there. Yeah. We unplugged the TV, unplugged it, the, the cable box, unplugged it, the air conditioner, everything was unplugged. So those things we we could rule out. Yeah, and we did, and we ruled it all out, and um, and then we started our EVPs, and it was amazing. I mean, they, they, everything. You know, again, not you know, going back to like we said earlier, where, you know, faulty electrical panels or, you know, bad old wiring or whatever it might be, you know, would absolutely cause these kind of things. But in this particular case, there was none. There was absolutely none. We we made sure of that because we don't want these false readings. And, and we went so far as to make sure our cell phones weren't doing yeah, it Yeah, shut those off. You got to, you know, and you have to do that. You have to shut your cell phone off. You have to do, make sure there's nothing. And so, uh, Oh, it was incredible. It was so strong. The energy was so strong in that room. Yeah, we didn't we didn't really get we've reviewed a lot of the uh, again, this is part of our documentary that we're working on. Uh, so we didn't, you know, to this point, we haven't really gotten a lot of visual stuff. But the, the audio for this one is mind blowing. It's great. Right. Um, the visual would, would be the actual meters going off. Like yeah. The REM pod is going nuts and the EMF detectors are beeping and everything's just yeah. going. Woo! And, you know, we're walking, you know, and that was, that was during the day, you know, so we, we got all that during the day. We should, of course, shut all the blinds, tried to make it as dark as possible. But, and then at night, that night, you know, the cemetery is right next to it. It's right outside the door. And so, you know, at two in the morning, you know, we're walking through the, the cemetery that has, you know, cause if you the, the, you know, the history behind Tonopah, there was a plague, and it wiped out quite a few people in that town. And it was during the winter, you know, where it was the worst. And and it was, uh, and so uh, a lot of people, you know, had died there. And and so the cemetery had a lot of really old gravestones and so forth. And there was a lot of history. The sheriff was buried in there and so so forth. And, you know, it's interesting. We thought for sure in cemeteries, as people would expect, you know, you, you, you're you going to get a lot of activity in a cemetery. Interestingly, we, we didn't get as much as we would have thought, you know, walking through that cemetery for probably two hours with all the equipment and everything. We, we really didn't get much there. We got more inside that hotel than we did in the cemetery outside the door. 
as we were there, but then as we reviewed the, but evidence, then the review, yeah, and then coming now back, we're, it's we're getting all now it's coming through on the on the on the cemetery. Yeah, so the documentary is going to be great because uh, you know again it's it's tedious though it's you know, to because we have to go through all this we have to stop the stop the audio you know mark the mark the point save it put in files and you know and then you know put it all together so uh it, it'll be good uh, you know I, we're we're happy you know that we have this to make the docu- documentary more intriguing you know obviously yeah. and this time we were able to get to the basement of the miss pop yeah and then we went back yeah we went back a second time and when the basement was clear and uh they let us go in there and same thing ton of ton of interesting stuff down there so that was that was a lot of fun now, are either of you guys sensitive in any way when you walk into these locations? Can you sense anything? I personally think that I'm the opposite. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've even made jokes about, well, I'm here. I guess they all left. Uh, they don't oh, want to that's talk. like me. I uh, say that, know. too. I'm about as sensitive as a rock. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. And I think there are people that are because uh, just, the, you know, the conversations I've had and, you know, especially our client, <laughs> you know, our personal uh, uh, personal investigation with our client. Um, she, she seemed like she had even more than just being sensitive, you know, but there's other people that, you know, have been on the team and we've talked to and they, they walk into a room and they're like, Oh, this feels heavy. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. and it's funny because, and you've probably thought this way too, Shannon, I'm sure is that we've gotten to the point <laughs> for that reason to bring in some bait, <laughs> you, know, like, <laughs> you know, like bring in somebody that is, you know, just to try to draw something in, you know, just bring in someone that's maybe really sensitive to this and, you know, that's a good segue to the concept of fear, right? So, uh, you sure. know, a lot of people say that they feed off fear, you know, these energies, these spirits, whatever, the more fear yeah. that you have, the more energy they can use. And me and him walk in with no fear. Like, <laughs> well, we don't have any fuel for you. Right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> like, so maybe we get somebody who's like scared of everything. <laughs> so we bring in this sacrifice. We have this, we have this you know, uh, person who's afraid of their own shadow. Yeah, bring them in. Find that Metro <laughs> officer. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Poke him with a stick. And you're like, hey, we got some fear here for you. <laughs> He's going to ask, what's in it for him? You know, right. it's, it's probably nothing. But uh, yeah, it, but I, honestly, I mean, it's it, all joking aside, we've, we've literally have thought that way, you know, because we've had some investigations. We're like, man, you know, this is all this effort that we go through, you know, sometimes to, to not get anything in person, live, you know, and that's what we really want. Right. But uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I'll be honest. It's, you know, we thought it, the thought has crossed our mind, you know, to bring someone in like that. But um, More sensitive than us. yeah, because <laughs> yeah, I've I've said it's like being tantamount to like being a, a can of bear spray to the paranormal. That's how I personally right. feel about myself yeah. sometimes, you know. I do. I feel the exact same way about myself. It's like I come in and they just leave. <laughs> like, <laughs> we're not talking to this guy. Deuces. <laughs> well, you don't. Yeah, but like, right. like some of your other guests you've had on, though, you know, again, it's your intentions, you know, and what you're there for yeah. and how we're naive to think that we understand them and we don't, <laughs> you know, and let's not kid ourselves. We were trying to, but to think that I, I think it was very logical, you know, to say that, all right, they, they, they know what we're doing. They know what our intentions are and they're not going to show themselves. I mean, you know, if we came in, you know, if we're walking through the woods not an investigator when let's just say we're lost you know we're walking through the woods somewhere hey maybe you're more likely you know to get an encounter but again it's an assumption and maybe statistically that might be the case there's there's way more evidence especially when it comes to bigfoot and sasquatch there's probably way more evidence with people that weren't weren't necessarily weren't weren't looking for (laughs) i i I venture to say anyway than people that are i think there's may really in fact be something to that and then you get to the point of, well, reverse psychology. Okay, I'll sit here and say nothing. You know? <laughs> yeah, but then, but then, then again, I, you know, like, okay, they know we're thinking that. Right, right. You know, so who are we kidding? Really? Yeah, that's just like going into a, a known, at least known to most, not to people like us, obviously, who, you know, sometimes we have to, to poke and prod a little bit more. But it's like going into a location. And I've seen even, you know, we'll bring Zach up again because he loves provocation, or at least he used to a whole lot. And laying on the ground and going, use my body for what you will, you know, you, okay. I, here I am, take my energy. I just feel like they'd still be like, eh, we don't want you. It, it's just kind of right. one of those things. You're too and, easy. Yeah, exactly. I just, I think if people are just predetermined that way, they're wired that way, these are people that they would be better at something like remote viewing than I would be. You know, they just have a little bit more of whatever mm. they're using in their brain, uh, whichever lobe that might be. They're, they're a little better at using that, and the, the, the rabbit ears on their antennas are a little bit more perked up. 
Yeah. I know so there was a guy on YouTube, I think it's called Huff Paranormal, and he kind of explains it uh, from his perspective. Uh, people can subscribe to it or not, but it, he basically says you can work on yourself to get yourself to a point where you are more receptive or they're, they're more willing to communicate with you, you know, and, and he, you know, he'll talk about meditation and, and, you know, being calm and, and coming in with an attitude of love and respect, you know, and things like that. But over time, he said, he said his evidence that he gets is uh, increased because of the work that he's done on himself. It's kind of like, you know, centering yourself and, you know, becoming one with the cosmos and, you know, doing all that. You know, I could do thing, the, you know, I could do the intention and the coming at it with love and positivity. I would, God, I would be horrible at meditation. Oh my goodness gracious. And yeah. maybe everyone that does it now and is awesome at it and loves it has said that I'm sure, but oh, I don't know if I could hone my brain in and close it down quite that yeah, much. Yeah, you gotta yeah, you gotta have a balance, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think yeah. yeah, you're right. You know, about the meditation, you're you're like giving it everything at that point. Okay, so when is this documentary uh due to come out? So yeah, we're we're kind of on the tail end of it. So I would say the documentary we're hoping maybe within the next month we should be we should have that released, which is um which will be on our website and YouTube. And what is the website and YouTube? So uh, blackseasofinfinity.net is the website. Oh, we're still working on the YouTube. YouTube we have a so, yeah, we have a Facebook, uh, Black Seas of Infinity, uh, on Facebook. Actually, that is what I mean. Okay, perfect. I will make sure to link the website and the Facebook. And then, yeah, I'm looking forward to that doc. I've not been to most of these locations that that a lot of the paranormal researchers have been to and hope to someday and then i can run screaming from a room that's what i'm looking forward to um well last but not least let's talk about black seas of infinity podcast so um that's also something that you know i'm fortunate enough here at my my office we have a really big studio here and that we're actually broadcasting right now from and uh so yeah we you know with all of our um uh, you know with all of our findings and and where we're heading and all that. We, we just feel like we have a lot of content to, to uh, provide to that. So that's also, uh, we're kind of fine tuning that right now. So I would venture to say that should be in the next, what you say, month or so on that. Mm -hmm. We're getting close to that one. So, um, yeah. So fortunately we have access to putting together a really, really good podcast in that sense. Well, congrats you guys. And you have good, uh, radio voices. Not that all of us are on the, the actual radio, but that's what <laughs> it's you. called. Radio voices. Thanks, there you go. Appreciate that. Absolutely. We well, yeah, are looking you. forward to it, guys. Excellent. Well, thank you. We appreciate being on. It was uh, really a pleasure for us. And yeah, know, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much. I don't get a lot out of the Nextdoor app, but in this case, I sure did. So thank you, Nextdoor <laughs> app. No, thank Absolutely. you guys so much for the time today and Happy New Year. And I, I definitely want to have you guys back. I mean, now I have finally a, a legit paranormal investigation team local yeah. that I would Stop. love to keep in contact with you guys. Absolutely. Absolutely. The feeling is mutual and, and whatever, you know, new investigations we have, we'll keep you in the loop. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, Shannon.